Having spent a lot of my working life looking at old photographs, many thousands of old photographs, I've been musing about the challenges that are going to face future historians. How on earth do they start dealing with the millions of images that are being produced every day? So, out of curiosity, I looked online to see if there's any estimate of the number of images that are being produced these days. I was staggered to see that somebody estimated there are over 14 trillion photographs being taken every year. So how on earth are future historians going to decide what's important and what is going to stand the test of time? Well, thankfully, it was a chance meeting at the Glyn Pits near Pontypool in 1968 that gave me access to a wonderful collection of old photographs that in turn gave me a much deeper insight into the history of coal mining in that area in the early years of the 20th century. I was there with my friend Roger Worsley and we were photographing the important buildings and equipment that still remained then. Beam engine, dated 1848, that was made at the Neath Abbey Ironworks, and a most amazing flat rope winder. Now, I haven't been to that site for many, many decades, and all I can hope is that the buildings and the machines have been cared for and preserved, because they are so very, very important. While we were clambering around those buildings, we were met by an elderly gentleman, William Edmund Jones, who said that he was on something of a sentimental journey because he'd started work there in 1903 at the age of 13. He was so knowledgeable about the site and during our conversation he mentioned that he had a couple of old photographs at home that might be of interest to us because these he'd taken in and around Pontypool in the early years of the 20th century. I went to see him the following week and we were in the front room drinking tea and eating homemade cake and then he went off to fetch his photographs as he said. He reappeared with a large heavy box that was full of glass plates and slides and he proceeded to scatter these on the hearth rug. Oh, within minutes I realised just how incredibly important these photographs were, capturing something of life above and below ground in that time and in that place. What makes his collection so important is that they're not only technically good images, but he knew the people that he photographed and he knew the places that he visited. Added to that though, William was actively encouraged in his hobby of photography by his father, Jabez, Jabez Jones, who was a founder member of the Independent Labour Party and a very big noise, as William said, in the South Wales Miners' Federation. And Jabez Jones actually used these photographs to illustrate talks that he gave on the Miners' Union. So these images take on varying levels of significance and are certainly among some of the most emotive documents that we have related to the history of coal mining in South Wales. I visited William Jones many times. He was a great letter writer, so he sent me a lot of information about the photographs. Many of the photographs have been reproduced many times but we thought that now during lock time was a good opportunity to look at these photographs again and place them in the context for which they were originally taken. William used a Thornton Picard half plate camera complete with tripod and when he was photographing underground he used a flash pan filled with magnesium powder or magnesium strip. Those brief flashes of light momentarily illuminated those workplaces to a level that most miners never ever saw. Those so-called naked lights 
mines were lit by candles that at best gave off a flickering intermittent light. And as the miners had to buy their own candles, well, in some cases they were rather circumspect about the number they actually used. This was before I had a tape recorder, so William Jones's comments are now read by Phil Jane. When undercutting or holing the coal, it was important to ensure that the candles are in line with the holing, a very necessary precaution when it's only one candle power. Working for long periods in poor lighting conditions could cause nystagmus, or as it was nicknamed, the staggers, which was the involuntary oscillation of the eyeballs caused by muscle strain. In some extreme cases, it could cause dizziness or even blackouts. Comradeship and mutual reliance was vitally important, but not all was sweetness and light, as William Jones recalled. He was the same age as my father, exactly. My father and him had a fight up here one day, and they were quarrelling about the place and what drams they were having. Getting drams was so vitally important, as obviously the amount of money that a collier earned depended on the amount of coal that he was able to get to the top of the pit. This photograph has been reproduced so many times. One of my favourite images is Billy Herland filling a dram using a curling box in the clog and legging level about 1910. The clog and legging was the nickname given for the plasticoid level. There's so much history encapsulated in this single photograph. Billy Herland's butty can be seen cutting the coal in the narrow seam. Billy's food bag is hanging from the cross timbers. Often the women would take great pride to make sure the bags were washed every day and whitened with chalk. A clean white bag was so very important. He's filling the dram using a curling box, which is a three-sided scoop onto which only lump coal was loaded because there were little or no markets for small coal at the time. Had William Jones arrived a little later to take the photograph, then the dram would have been raced or raised with coal high above its sides to maximise on its carrying capacity. The number chalked on the side referred to the collier and his butty who dug the coal and filled that dram. As they were paid on output, it was essential that the drams were weighed at the pit top. The companies employed their own weighers and it was sometimes not unknown for underweighing to take place. So the unions insisted upon check weighers to be present. The weighing machines they used were known as Billy Choriteg or Billy Fair Play. I came across a short rhyme about such a machine in Gilvach Goch, and it dates from 1910, and the Die Goose who's mentioned was the pit manager at that time. Billy fair play, boys, Billy fair play. I'm digging small coal for a penny a day. And if you grumble, Die Goose, he will say, go to your office and collect your pay. The check wares were often involved with the local politics, and Jabez Jones was a member of the Executive Council of the South Wales Miners' Federation. There's my father, on the right, and the check weigher at Tepentis, Tom Morgan. So Jabez and William Jones were actually pioneers in using photographs for political purposes. William remembered so clearly how the audiences responded to his father's talks, and especially the use of uh, a little bit of satire. <laughs> One of the slides was entitled, Donkeys in the House of Lords. 
a four-line verse accompanied this slide. The first three from the men on top of the plank and the last one from the men below. I can remember this cartoon in the Labour Leader of years ago. Rent, profit and interest. Oh, my father was mad on this. He would use that. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. Nowadays, we're all too aware of the potency of images captured on mobile phones and how their widespread dissemination can have such huge impacts. In their own way, William and Jabez Jones were doing much the same thing, taking those pioneering photographs. We hope to produce a few more films about that wonderful father and son.